Um, what, what do we mean when we talk about this subject, when we say us and them? I mean, I think when we, we say that something is an us and them situation or that people have gotten into an us and them mentality, we want to say that something bad has happened, that things are getting, things are, have gone uh, in, the, in the wrong direction. Um, and so uh, to illustrate how we tend to think about this, I want to use a, an American classic. Uh, no? Let's see. Uh, I'm not clicking. Um, good? OK. So, uh, <laughs> OK. Uh, so, as I said, what I want to think about what we mean when we talk about this, uh, when we use this phrase as we like to, this an us and them situation or an us and them mentality. So the American classic I want to cite is, uh, this is a still from South Park, 10th um, season. This is a race of highly intelligent otters who are fighting a, um, uh, a bunch of humans who are uh, two tribes of humans who are also fighting one another. Um, and all of these creatures, the, the evolved humans uh, in the two tribes and the otters, are, uh, are determined to wipe each other out because they do not share the answer to the great question. Um, and they, they, they think that only their, their answer is the right one. They have to wipe out all the others. Uh, and the, answer, the, the great question you learn at the end turns out to be, should we be called the uh, Atheist Alliance or the Allied Atheist Allegiance or the Unified Atheist League? Okay, so um, this is a pretty good illustration, I think, of what we talk about when we talk about us and them. There's generally a component of violence. We think somebody's going to get hurt. There is um, a sense that Everyone involved is not seeing that they're similar in many ways, um, and uh, they look more alike. I know these are supposed to be otters, but in the episode, they sound just like the people, and the two tribes of people look exactly the same to the viewer, but they, they are, go on and on about how different they are. And, and thirdly, uh, generally, we think the stakes are ridiculous. I mean, who cares whether it's the Allied Atheist Allegiance or the Unified Atheist League? And that is another um, almost universal aspect of this, is that to the outsider, the, the, the reason for the conflict looks absurd. And I think that is very typical of the conversations we have on this subject where we're talking about Republicans versus Democrats or Israelis versus Palestinians or pro-choice or pro-life. If you are outside it, you think, what's the big deal? I mean, why can't people just get along? Why can't you guys just compromise? And if you're inside it, you think, well, you just don't understand. Um, you, you had to be there. Uh, look at look at my wounds. Don't they? They don't mean. They have to mean something, right? So, um, I think if you want to understand this us and them phenomenon, you have to understand this duality. Why are we capable of caring so much about who's us and who's them that we are willing to kill or to die about it? But also. Why That was a tough day, and feeling like there's some common ground. Um, uh, or in the opposite direction, toler uh, going from uh, living next to the neighbors for, for years and years, and then deciding, no, no, the Tutsi and Hutu cannot possibly live together. So the, the, the way that we can sort of minimize this at some times and at other times suddenly make it super important is what we have to understand, both aspects, being distant from it and being in it. Um, and I would argue that if you think you're outside of us and them, that us and them is happening to other people, I, I want you to think about the following statements. Suppose I were to say it didn't matter really who won the, the Civil War in the 19th century because this country was going from agrarian to industrial and slavery would have faded out anyway, so really who cares? Or I could say, I don't care who wins this year's presidential election, they're all alike. Or I could say, who cares who wins the World Series or the Super Bowl, it's just a bunch of guys in pajamas running around chasing a ball and starts a few months after it ends anyway, what difference does it make? Or I could say, who cares who controls the seeds? Should it be farmers? Should it be companies? Whatever. There's supermarkets. All right? Now, I don't happen to believe any of that stuff, but 
I think that um, you might want to think about how you emotionally reacted to one or some of those statements. And I think that I would be willing to bet that some of them felt deeply angry-making wrong to you. And that's because they were us-them conflicts. I was referring to us-them conflicts in which you are involved, in which you do feel you have a stake, in which you can't just say, oh, well, why can't they just sort this out? And that's important. Now, a lot of us are taught to like the feeling that um, we are, can be above us and them, that it's a far, it's, it's not, got nothing to do with what, we, what matters to us, that we're distant from it. And that is important to, to get away from uh, uh, the, some of the worst conflicts in the world today, to sort of try to transcend it. But it's also um, important to realize that we need both, as, as, as Brian was saying. It's not bad to care about um, us, in some sense, in this world. And I, I think if you don't think that, um, try to imagine what your life would be like if you had no us feeling in it. So if you heard that, say, 100 American soldiers were killed this morning in a by a suicide bomber, you'd think, well, I didn't know any of them. I don't care. Or, um, or if you were cheating on your spouse, you'd never have a moment of thinking, you know, I'm a husband, there's other husbands, they don't do this. Or I go to church, other people here at church with me, they don't do this. Or other parents, they don't do this. I'm a parent, we don't do this. Maybe I should think about what I'm doing. No, you would never think anything like that because you would be in this little pillar of yourself without any reference to the rest of humanity. You wouldn't know what our kind of food is or what our kind of music is and you wouldn't know what we do when someone dies and you have this sadness and this loss to deal with. So, Usness is important. It's not something you want to transcend all the time in your life. Okay, so how is it though that we can be both inside and outside this experience? So we can care so much and not care so much about these kind of identities and sometimes about the same ones, okay? All right, so I write about science and, and I've been fascinated by this question for a long time and I've had the good fortune um, because I write about science to, to come upon um, the fact that Science can actually tell us a lot about this issue. Um, there's been a lot of work in the last decades in, in psychology, in social psychology, in sociology, anthropology, in social cognitive neuroscience, and it's given us some insights. Uh, the key one of which I think is that what feels real and feels right about this us-them business is really not what is real when we look at it in a scientific way. Okay, so in order to illustrate this, I'm going to play you a little film. And could you play the film now, please? OK, so I'd just like you guys to watch this. It was made in 1944 by um, a pair of psychologists, uh, uh, Marianne Simmel and Fritz Heider. And uh, if you just sort of pay attention to what's going on for, uh, for a second there. I'm going to talk a little over it, but I, I do want you to kind of think about what's happening there. Okay, so um, the question that they asked after they showed people this film was, write down what happened in the picture. And what people almost unanimously did, and what I suspect you, you did, is, um, is not to talk about uh, um, uh, angles of motion or geometric shapes. They said things like, well, the circle was getting pushed around by the big triangle, and then the little triangle came, and then they fought, and then at the end, the big triangle was really mad, and um, I mean, I, I'm going to guess that that was part of what was going on in your heads, right? I mean, you, okay. Now, 
that's really important. What that means is that when they were trying to, when they were looking at this thing that's so simple, as you could see, it's just lines and, and dots and shapes, people did not um, see lines and shapes. They told themselves a story. And that's, that's really very important here because story narrative is the way we understand the world and it really runs very deep. It's, it's, it's kind of the heart of all of our knowledge. Um, in fact, it takes an effort not to tell stories. It takes an effort to be, to be really precise, to not talk about thinking, feeling beings that have desires and go out and do things in the world. And, and we are so inclined to think that way that, you know, if your car doesn't start, you, you might kick it. And then later you think, well, it's just a car. I mean, it wasn't trying to make me late. But your first impulse is this is, a, this is something that has thoughts and feelings and it knows I want to go somewhere and it's not cooperating. It's very hard to resist this. Um, and and um, it's really stories that are the easiest thing to remember, the things that are hard to forget, and, and they're the things that are effective in rousing our emotions. So that, for example, if I say to you there are 400 accidents out of every 100,000 car trips, you really should wear a seatbelt might work, you know, that might be convincing to you. But if I say my cousin had a horrible accident last Sunday and he was saved by wearing his seatbelt, I, I think that's going to stick in your mind a lot longer and motivate you a lot more. Um, okay, so this experiment is based on the, f the last one I showed you. Um, I don't have the film, but this is uh, a very similar experiment with shapes moving about that was um, uh, shown to people by Paul Bloom and Saba Veras in 1999. And what you'll notice here is that the actors are not solid objects, but collections of smaller things, right? And when people were asked um, to, once again, write down what happened in this very, in this, this geometrically abstract thing, what the people did was exactly the same for these groups of objects as it was for the single objects in, well, actually, they compared this to single objects. So they know for a fact the same, the same group of people, if they, they, they did not change their descriptions when, when, when they were talking about groups. Um, and in other words, they treated these groups of fellow travelers that were doing kind of the same thing at the same time as if they were parts of a single thing, which is, of course, what we do all the time when we talk about groups, when we say China wants to play a role in Africa, or the Republican Party wants to win, or Iran wants a nuclear bomb, right? Okay. So point here is we see groups, we think of them easily as, as single individuals, and, and that's very important in terms of our understanding and our feelings about groups. Okay, but that obviously raises a question, well, when do we see people as groups? When, and one of the answers to that is, well, sometimes people very much want to be seen as a group, so they all dress alike, soldiers are dressed alike, and they march in unison because their leaders want them to feel they're human parts of, of one big single thing, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is, while we can sort of encourage our people to see us that way, by, by dressing alike or talking alike or singing in, in, in unison or something, um, we really don't need much of a cue to see people as together. Um, in fact, I think there's very good evidence that we're always kind of putting people together, always keeping score of like who belongs with who, and that we use very, very slight cues in order to do that. Um, Sometimes it could be uh, the same color shirt, the same religious symbol. Uh, sometimes it's something we imagine people share. Um, uh, but what's very important is, is that to understand that um, uh, we do this so easily that sometimes we do this when we're just looking at people who are, um, happen to be in the same place. And if they're there long enough, um, by accident, we will start to say, well, maybe they belong together. Um, I'll give you an example of this. When I was in high school, my high school was 50% African American students, 50% Caucasian students, more or less. And so in order to prevent us from self-segregating, um, our teachers organized us by astrological sign. This is California in the 1970s. I guess you could probably tell, but anyway. So we had a Taurus homeroom, we had a Sagittarius homeroom, and so on. So, and this was great for making sure that there was, you know, not a, like an a, a, a all-white anything or an all-African-American uh, anything. But um, it caused some of our teachers to start to believe in astrology. <laughs> some of them would start to say, well, you know, you Tauruses, well, you really like to be alone. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that was, you know, I think very striking. They saw us every day in the same place, and they started to find reasons why we fit together. Um, Okay, so there's also considerable evidence that that is um, a very automatic thing, that it's not learned. Um, one of the reasons that people think that is because of experiments 
um, that are done with pictures like this with small children, where you take people who are, uh, look very much alike, except on one thing, like maybe they're wearing different clothes, maybe they're one, one set of people is fat and one set of people is thin, or in this case, different skin tones, and you ask a little kid, well, who's, if you have a child and, a, and an adult, who's the parent of whom? Or um, which one was this person as a child, now that you see the adult person? And what you find is that, is that kids don't, there's not a scatter plot, they're not all over the map. They're not saying, well, if the, the clothes match this time, then maybe that's it. Uh, or they, they stick to um, uh, some, some they, they want to see things that are, that are persuasive. And, and when they're persuaded, they really, they're really quite stubborn about it. And so, for example, uh, skin tone is very persuasive to them. And then they, they, they will resist the idea that, um, that you can change even though we know that people can change, but a little kid will tell you that if you're Italian um, uh, by birth, if you go to Korea and you learn only Korean and you uh, eat only Korean food and you have a Korean family, you're still Italian. Um, it's, it's a kind of an intuition we don't want to let go of, that people have places where they belong and we don't want to uh, see that they're in some other place. All right. Um, so, so here we are. We have, these, we have these groups that we really care about and we imagine are very real. And we like to tell stories about why things happen as a consequence of actions that people do, in the, uh, individuals with thoughts and feelings do in the world. And we see these groups as kind of big individuals. So um, I think now you can see that we're, we're, uh, we're starting to get at why us and them is such a part of our lives. Um, the one missing piece uh, is, of course, that when, um, when we're really, really um, touched by stories, it's when they feel like they concern us directly. In other words, again, if I say we should help prevent children in the third world dying of diarrhea, it's so simple to treat, um, that's a logical argument to you. But if I say, look, here's this family, and they're just like you. There's a mother and a father and a sister and a brother. Help them. That is more compelling. Um, so that's where I think we get this us-them dynamic. Um, it's kind of inescapable in human nature that we see the world as caused by thinking, feeling beings, that some of those beings are things made of people. And then we tell these stories about these individuals and the ones that make us most uh, emotional and most uh, make us jump the highest are the ones where we feel we're personally um, involved. Um, Okay, so this adds up to some pretty strong convictions about groups, some pretty strong intuitions about them and what they're doings and what they mean. Um, but what, and what also adds up to is it pushes us away from the fact that the groups that we're seeing come from our minds. We really want them to be real. We want them to be permanent. We don't want to think we just projected it onto the dots. We tend to forget that. Um, and I think that that's... Um, very important to realize that, that um, the groups that we see in the world are not these kind of real objects that persist in time and space. And I would say that one of the reasons that you can, I mean, there are plenty of evidence for that. I mean, you, groups you know are not the same thing to all members at the same time. You know, do all Christians, do Christians ever differ about what it means to be a good Christian? Yes. Groups don't persist eternally. I mean, I assume none of you have ever, has ever met a Visigoth or an Aryan heretic, right? Um, the same group isn't the same in all places. Italian Americans are not the same as Italians. Um, what it, a, a, a French person from the 12th century, like Joan of Arc, what would she have made of the scandal about, you know, Dominique Strauss-Kahn? Uh, I think she would have been surprised that he was sent to go see a magistrate, not burned at the stake. And yet, that's they're both French, right? Okay. Um, and of course, the most important aspect of this is that people are members of many different groups at the same time. So I'm a Democrat, I'm a white person, I'm a baby boomer, I'm a New Yorker, a man, a parent. And which membership matters seems to depend on what's relevant in the situation you find yourself in. I'll give you one example of that. There was a, a trial in New York City of a police officer who was a, a abused a suspect that he'd arrested in uh, August of 1997. And in the course of the testimony in this trial, um, it came out that uh, 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 one of these uh, uh, white policemen had beaten a, uh, a black suspect. And then the, both men happened to be in the bathroom of the police station where this had taken place. And the white officer who looks at the suspect, notices a cross on his chest, and says, I'm a Christian too. I'm really sorry about what I did. So there you have the, the, the police suspect one race, other race dynamic uh, being replaced, not forever, not the end of the world. It's, it's not, it's, it's not, doesn't solve any great problems. But in that moment, 
they saw each, the, that officer changed how he saw the other person, because they're members of both groups. Both groups were um, available. Um, and then finally, I think it's also important to recognize that a rival, a, an identity that's super important to one person in the same place and time is completely trivial to another. Um, this is one of many clips I could show you of people getting really injured or even killed for sports loyalty, which doesn't mean a lot to some people, but obviously means a great deal to others. So um, again, this notion that we're all sort of fixed in these permanent groups that have a kind of reality independent of our minds, I think is really, really a mistake. And I think there are two takeaways here um, that are very important to keep in mind. One is that the mind seems to be arranged to prefer to see groups as if they were individuals, as beings made of people who act like individuals and have thoughts and fears and hopes and desires. We tell stories about those groups as we tell stories about individuals, like when we came to this country, we were poor. Um, and the stories that matter the most are those that engage our need to belong and to know who is with us in that belonging. And the other takeaway is that contrary to what we see in collections of people, they are not in reality things. They're activities. They are, to be more precise, storytelling activities. In other words, I think that when we, we don't have these solid groups of people and then tell tales about them. We tell the tales and that's what makes the groups. Um, and they overlap because stories can overlap and they change because stories can change. And, um, and I think that the usefulness of, of this, to conclude, is not that we can then say, oh gosh, it's all done with mirrors, let's just have peace and love forever because that's not, that's not gonna happen. People, have conflicts and it's always going to be with us. The usefulness of seeing identity as a story is, is that we can say, well, we know that a story can grab us and excite us and make us angry the way a movie can, but we also know that a movie ends and then we think about something else. And, and in the same way, I think um, it's important to acknowledge that this, has a, this, this, this process, this, these mental processes have, an, have a great hold on us, um, but we can uh, get some distance on them. Um, it's important in order to do that, though, that we never say, well, your story makes no sense. It's just silly. You know, why don't you just split the cake and go home? Because we have to acknowledge that we have our stories that we care about. Um, and I think we also have to realize that our goal shouldn't be the end people telling these stories, but rather, I think, to have people feel free to take part in more stories. So in other words, I think we don't need less us-them thinking. I think we need more us-them thinking. Not in the, in, the, in the hostile, desperate sense, but I think that the, with the more alternative versions of us that people can touch, the less likely they are to be captured by only one, and the more easily they can get some distance on the business of telling stories. And, and maybe that makes it more likely in the long run that they can find a story of us that lets them live in harmony with others and invent better stories for the future. Thank you.